Hello YouTube. Today we're going to be taking a step backwards. Yeah, if you're new to my channel then you might not know really what I'm talking about here, but I've already reviewed the sequel to this movie. Yeah, I've already looked at the first at the sequel to Captain America. So we're actually going to be going back here a little bit. So yeah, don't be expecting a review of the sequel anytime soon, because I've already done that. I don't know, I just kind of find that ironic. Well, let's look into it. So the story is about Steve Rogers, a man from Brooklyn who will not stop until he gets into the army. There's only one problem, he's kind of scrawny. And... Yeah, the army keeps on rejecting him for this. Um, there could be some uses in that. Like, oh, I don't know, um, you could send him behind enemy lines, he could sneak into places better, you could use him as a spy, he could be good in that, or, heck, you could even use him to throw the enemy off, they wouldn't expect him. I mean, you have an army filled with all these guys that look like they should be in the army. They would never expect a guy who was incredibly scrawny. Why not just send him in? He could be useful. But the army apparently does not see these uses, so they keep on rejecting him. But this won't stop him, as no matter what he does, he keeps on Because no matter what happens, he keeps on trying. He can't even do what they're doing in the film. Yeah, this is something that's really bothered me. I know this is kind of off topic here, but... In this movie, there is a little film, like a propaganda movie, like talking about the war and everything that's happening. And they say, even little Timmy is helping out and collecting scrap metal. And well, if Steve Rogers wants to help out so much, why didn't he do that? I mean, okay, it wouldn't be helping out that much, as, or at least not as much as he wants, but it would still be helpful. Just saying, I really don't get why he doesn't do this. It could be pretty useful, but instead he keeps on ignoring it like it's not a thing that he can do for some reason. I guess that collecting metal is too much, even for him. So, yeah, he really does want to get into the army, and he meets up with a scientist who says he can get him in. And he gets in! He does horrible, but he gets in! And then he is approached by the scientist yet again, who says, hey, I can make you a super soldier, then the, then the army would actually be happy to have you aboard. So, he of course says yes to this, and he becomes a super soldier. But, Right after this happens, the doctor who made the machine is shot, and they can't give it, and they can't give any of this super, super soldier serum to anyone else. So now, being the only one that has these abilities, the army doesn't really know what to do with him. Until one guy comes out with an ingenious plan as to how to use this super soldier who can be very useful in battle. Get him in a costume, and then have him go on stage, so then people can want to enlist in the army. Um... Who left that guy in charge? How did that guy get in the army? Really? I don't know what position of power this guy has. They never explain this, it's just he was there watching the superhero serum thing happening. And it's never explained what his point was there. Why did they let this guy in the army who could act who actually kinda of destroyed a lot of their plans? And I mean, they took away the super soldier. I think they would need the super soldier. But then again, the army was just gonna leave him there and not do anything with them, so 
at least he's being proactive doing this. I guess. Yeah, I really have no idea why this happened, but hey, it's kind of neat that they actually bring up, like, the old classic era of comics and everything. They even show the Captain America comic books. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, as you can probably guess, being a stage man kind of annoys the captain as well, the reason why he joined the army was because he wanted to fight for his country. He can't really do that on a stage. But now he hears that his friend, Bucky, is now being held captive. So, this sparks something in him that makes him get two of the people that he's been working with into a plane so he can jump out of it and then go save his friends. The obvious idea. So, he breaks in there, and he meets up with the first subject of the superhero series, of the super soldier, sorry, super soldier, I don't know why I can't remember that. But he meets up with the first man who got the super, so the super soldier serum. Who is this? The Red Skull. If you do not know this character, you clearly have never looked into a Captain America story. But, the Red Skull is a guy who works for Hydra, an organization started up by the Nazis. Because they couldn't just have them fight Nazis. So yeah, that was actually a thing that happened in the comic books. They wouldn't allow um, them fighting the Nazis anymore because they thought it was pretty offensive. So they decided, okay, we're going to stop having you hitting Hitler, and instead have you just fight, hit the Red Skull. That'll make everything better. And it did, so the character stuck. And over the years, he became one of the greatest Captain America villains. So, yeah, that's pretty cool to see him finally take shape in this movie. It only took, I have no idea how long it's been since, they had a Captain America movie, but I think it was in the 90s. So it's only taken like, you know, 11 years, I guess. So now he finally has his enemy. And what exactly is this enemy trying to do? He is trying to control a rock and put it into a gun. Which sounds really stupid when I say it out loud. And, to be honest, in the movie it is kind of dumb, and other people do see it as a dumb idea. So I'm not the only one, yay. But it's not just any rock he's trying to gain the energy from to point to a gun. It's the Tesseract, which, in, which if you read into the Infinity War, then you would know that this is the Blue Infinity Stone. Which is, of course, the Mind Stone, or not at all. Yeah, here it's not the Mind Stone whatsoever. What is it here? I have no idea! I think it's supposed to be the Power Stone, but they never really clarify it as that. And also, in Guardians of the Galaxy and um, Thor the Dark World, they have two other stones that could also be used as the power stone. Are all the Infinity Stones in these in the Cinematic Universe now just all the power stones? Like, none of them have their own definitive power to them? Okay, well, I guess that there was the one in Age of Ultron that was the Mind Stone, but that color was yellow! It's incorrect! I'm sorry I'm ranting about this, it's just incorrect, and it really irks me. So much that I just said irk. So, yeah, now Captain America has to stop um, the the Red Skull, who how who now I can't just say who has his Tesseract and has now been able to power it into a gun, and is also mass producing it somehow. Did they obtain the energy from the? from the Infinity Stone to get that? I really don't get how that would work. What was the process of that? I really wish that they went to this ex 
into this and into this development stage of these guns a little bit more. They don't do that with a shield. Why could they do that with this? But yeah, now it's up to Captain America along with the Howling Commandos. If you're a comic book fan, you know that that is awesome. Um, to be able to stop the Red Skull. But when they finally do get close to doing it, Bucky dies for one, and that just sends it, that just sends Cap on a on a rage. So now that pretty much just really annoys Cap. Yeah, you really shouldn't have killed his best friend there, Skull. That that wasn't really your smartest move. Like, oh yeah, I'm killing off his best friend. That won't get him annoyed at all. I mean, okay, the Red Skull wasn't there, but still picked a pretty dumb way of transporting the stone. It was transporting on a train with, like, only a very narrow track on holding it up. The track that they're, holding, that they're using to hold it up doesn't even look like it can support the train. I really don't get why that was his method of transportation there. Like... Wouldn't you have enough money to at least stabilize the train a little bit more? It really does not look stable. I mean, okay, that wouldn't have helped out Bucky at all, but... It still would have helped out your train here a little bit. I mean, it really does not look stable. So, yeah. Now that his friend is dead, Cap has an axe to grind. So, he goes in and is able to defeat Red Skull by just handing him the Tesseract. Again, if you know the Infinity Stones, you know why that's a bad thing. Or if you just saw this movie, or any of the other Marvel Cinematic Universe movies that I've listed with the Infinity Stones in them, then you know what they do. And so, now with the Red Skull killed, I will get to that later, what is Cap going to do? Now Cap has to just has to move this plane that he's in away from New York, which is where it's heading and crash and is set to crash. So what is he gonna do? Turn the plane around? There's no real bombs on it anymore for them to go off. So I mean like there's no real time limit to this. So I mean he's in control of the plane. Is he gonna turn around or something? Nope. He's just gonna crash into some icy waters or he'll freeze. For 70 years and wake up in present day so he can join the Avengers. Just play that bit with how it should have ended here. I mean, really, that's what I watched after watching this movie. And they pretty much bring up all the reasons that him being frozen in the water made no sense. I mean, really, why did he let himself freeze? There were other options around this. But, yeah, now he, wo now he woke up in present day, so he can now join the Avengers. And the movie ends. So, what do I think about the story here? Well, it's alright. But it's definitely the weakest part of this movie. I think that the characters definitely do carry it so much more because on its own this story is pretty weak it's just sort of the origin of this character which is very cool and I do like seeing that come and it is really cool with the designs of everything that they have it definitely does feel very vintage and they have made some very cool upgrades to this character like this is one thing that I really do think is very cool and I really want to bring up is that Cap's suit here is all completely functional. The suit that he wears when he's actually going into battle, that suit is completely functional. The director of this movie made sure that every part of this suit had some purpose that would actually fit into military procedures. That is just awesome. I really gotta give him credit for doing that. And in some respects, they do bring some of the 
some of the stuff from the comics to life. You really do see how all this sort of stuff played out, and even though some of it's not that sensical, not that filled with sense here, I mean, really? Really couldn't have just turned the plane around and done something about this? I mean, you were in control of the plane! And there were little ships that you could have gone into to get out! Why couldn't you have just gone out of this freaking plane? You could have had your stupid dance with Peggy. God, you are an idiot. But, yeah, I do think that the story is alright. I just don't really think that if it was left on its own or without any really good characters to support it, then it would probably fail. I mean, this is a pretty overdone story. It's just sort of, there's the bad guys. They have a magical element. We need to stop them. So let's make our own super soldier thing with science. Okay, send him in there. We'll be good. We'll, we'll be fine now. That's pretty much how it all plays out. So, there isn't really that much originality to it. Um, but I do really think that there are some cool things in here that do need to be admired. Um, but, and there are, there are also parts that are very cliched and have been done. But, I guess I was supposed to tie in more to, like, well, the comics were kind of cliché, too, but there's something really cool about them for some reason, and that doesn't really end up all that well here. Here, it's just, well, it's okay. They do it fine, and I do think for an origin, it's just pretty good. Um, it's not really an origin that we've seen that much. This character hasn't really been adapted to screen that often, so... It's not like it's a major origin thing that we've seen a hundred times, like Peter Parker's or anything. It is still its own sort of origin and everything, and it is pretty unique in some ways. But, all in all, I think I'm just going to have to give it a 5 out of 10, because the story is definitely what holds this film. It just kind of holds it down. It, it really does weigh it down. But there are still some good characters that do support it, so let's look into them. So when it comes to the characters, we of course have to talk about the main one first, that being Captain America, also known as Steve Rogers. Now, I gotta say, Chris Evans plays him really well. He does really seem to know what this character is like. He seems to he seems like he's, it seems like he's read the comics before, he knows how to play the character, and he's probably the best actor in this movie. I mean, there are really good actors in this movie, but he's probably the best one in here. Um, also, the fact that they actually were able to CGI him down, that's something that really needed a lot of work here. They need to CGI him down in every frame until he actually got the superhero serum. Super soldier serum. Why do I keep on messing this up? But um until they actually got that serum, they had to they had to make him look weak and scrawny for every frame. And he had to adjust to that the whole movie. He also apparently was the one who actually decided on the shield throwing and how they were going to do it in the first place. Yeah, they just said, hey, show us how you can throw the shield, and he did it. And they thought, okay, that's a cool way of doing it, we're gonna keep that. So that's kind of cool. So, I do really think that Chris Evans was a great pick for this role, and he really does make this character, but for the character himself, he's very likable. Like what you would expect with Captain America, he does fight for America, I don't see how you could get any confusion there. Um, you do really see that he is noble in the movie, except for when he's in that stupid plane. You could have just landed the plane, but no, you instead had to just crash into an iceberg. I, I'm sorry, just... This really annoys me. I don't know why. But... Yeah, I do think that this character is pretty good. Um, he's definitely better in the sequel, but here he does fine. 
So after him, we have Peggy Carter, who I kind of like, but there are some moments that I really don't get with her. Like, for one moment, she'll be nice to Steve, and then out of nowhere, she'll just be really angry at him. I don't... I mean, okay, I kind of got it, and he was caught kind of kissing another girl, but he could have explained what happened. I guess that's more his fault than hers, but still, she should question judgment and character. Like, why would he do this? Never came into her mind. But I will say she is pretty well done. Um, I definitely liked her more than that female CSI agent in X-Men First Class. She's definitely- Peggy Carter is definitely much better than that character altogether. Which, they do sort of seem to kind of have the same bare bones of their characters, but in execution they are much different. And I do like Peggy's execution. Hers is much better. So, yeah, I think that she's pretty, she's pretty well done. After her, we have Bucky Barnes, who is so much better in the sequel. I mean, wow. He is so much better and more interesting in the sequel than this. But as a way to establish his character, I think that they do fine. I mean, okay, he's definitely not my favorite character in the movie, but he does well. And I think that as a step, as a starting point for the character and knowing what they were going to do with him already, I think they do pretty well with it. And I actually, and I do actually care about him when he falls to his death, so, or at least his supposed death. Yeah, everyone's seen the sequel, why do I even need to do that? So... Yeah, when he falls, then when you see this for the first time in theaters, you think, Oh no, he fell, unless if you already knew the story. Then you would just be like, okay, Winter Soldier is happening next, cool. But, yeah, I do still think that it is kind of cool with what they do with him at times. But, yeah, he is done much better in the sequel. But I will say that they do set him up pretty well, so. After that, we have Red Skull, who is played by Hugo Weaving. That's an odd casting choice. I just gotta say that. That's a very unique casting choice. I never would have thought of Hugo Weaving for Red Skull, but... His, in his defense, he does pretty well. He can actually pull off a German accent pretty well, which I was surprised by. He's not all that over the top at times, which, when he does go over the top, you can just sort of see, like, okay, he means, he means business here, everyone get back to work. Um, and his makeup effects, well, not really that great. I mean, okay, it's alright, and I can see why they didn't want to CGI every shot of him after CGIing every shot with Steve Rogers, but, yeah, it doesn't really look that good. I mean, okay, the mask is fine, I guess, but, and I do think that is pretty cool with all the practical designs they went into, just so you know, the TV channel that I watch this on got a lot of behind-the-scenes information here. So, if it seems like I'm talking about behind-the-scenes information a little bit, then, yeah, that's why. And I do like how much effort that they put into the makeup effects, but... Eh, it didn't really come out that well, but... Weaving performance was surprisingly pretty good. I do actually kind of wish that he did live in the end, seeing as he is such an important villain. But, eh, you know, you win some, you lose some. So, it was still at least pretty cool to see him here anyway. Then after him, we have Howard, the, Howard Stark, who is 
alright, um, but there's not really much to him, mainly because he's not in the film that much. When he's on screen, he's okay, I mean, he's a pretty good inventor and everything, and I can definitely see Tony Stark in him, but, yeah, he's not that great. We don't really get to know him that well, he's just sort of there a little bit, and then he's just gone. So, it does kind of feel weird that there's not really all that much to him, and eh, he's also not the best inventor. I mean, his flying car thing just, like, fell apart. I mean, okay, sure, it is a flying car, but he powered Stark. Come on. Um, so... Yeah, he's an alright character. I just wish that we could have seen him a bit more. And then after that, we have Chester Phillips. The character which everybody remembered from this movie. I'm sure everyone was just leaving the theater saying, Hey, wasn't Chester Phillips done well? Okay, so... What do I think about Chester Phillips? He's kind of a jerk. Yeah, he's just kind of a jerk. That's pretty much his whole character there. I mean, I get it, they're in war and everything, but... He's pretty rude. But I guess he is kind of cool. That's all I really got in his character there. I don't know why I added him to my character list. He's not that important. Um, but then after him, we have our final character, Argamzola. And... I have really nothing to say about this character. There's not really that much to him. He's just sort of the scientist on the villain side. He's pretty much the Howard Stark of the villains here. So, I really like the Howard Stark in this movie on the enemy side. He's not in it that much, but when he is, he's, he's alright, I guess. Um, he does play a little bit of a bigger part than, than Stark in this, but... Yeah, he's not really all that great, and at least I know he's a better villain. At least I do know he be he goes inside of a TV screen and then becomes a villain that can hack into anything. What do do? Yeah, I'm not really that thrilled about this villain, but maybe they can make him cool. So. Yeah, he's alright, I guess. I just don't really care that much about him. Like, if he were to be the one to fall off the train instead of Bucky, I would probably just said, Oh no. Zola. Whatever will I do? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I just don't really care about what his character was going through or anything. There wasn't really that much to get me invested in him. So, for the characters here... I'm gonna give it a six and a half out of ten. It's all right. There, some of the casting is really great, and some of the characters are spot on, and I really do enjoy them. But then there are also some that are just eh, not in it long enough, or just really don't have that much to their character. So it really just depends as to which character you're focusing on. That's sort of where it depends to which one is more interesting. But all in all, for the characters, I do think that they're fine. And the way they work into the movie is pretty good. So, I never felt like they were really that forced. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about the Howling Commandos. They're cool. Yeah, that's pretty much it. We don't really find anything about their personalities or anything. It's just, they're the Howling Commandos. That's awesome. Nothing else to add to that, it's just they're pretty cool. So, what do I think about this movie, all in all? Well, it's definitely a give-or-take movie. I mean, there are some aspects that are pretty well done, and I do think that creativity and set design put into the behind-the-scenes stuff is really cool. I mean, they really did make this stuff really well. Seriously, go watch some of these bonus features. If you can pull it up on FX, do that you will get some really cool insider information.
so I do think that it is kind of cool what they went through to make this movie and everything, and in the end, I don't think that it was wasted. I don't think that was a wasted opportunity. I think it did bring the character to life in a way that we haven't really seen before, but yeah, there are some pretty negative spots to it, too, and I, even though I do think that it is a pretty good movie, and one that I'm fine with seeing again, I mean, if someone were to make me watch it again, I'd just say, yeah, alright, I'm, I'm for that. I wouldn't object or anything, but if you're looking for a really good Captain America movie, watch this one first, but just to find out what happens in this movie, so then you can really enjoy the sequel. But, as a way for setting up the character, I don't think they did anything bad. I think they did it within what they were able to do. I don't really know how I would have made a Captain America movie any better. I mean, I think that with what they did, it was fine. Not really what people expected with Captain America here, but I think it was alright. So, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. It didn't really meet my expectations, but it didn't really break them either, so I thought it was okay. And next week, we will be looking at Jumanji. Bye.